Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily, now available on Roku TV. I'm Aaron Porras. And I'm Natasha Kirchuk. And coming up in today's newscast, Israeli leaders are given just six weeks to get U.S. President Donald Trump's peace deal of the century going. We'll hear the unbelievable story of an 87-year-old Holocaust survivor here in Israel who survived the war as a young child by hiding out in the forest for more than two years. And the Israeli army is going wild on social media. We'll take a look at some of the viral videos that Israeli soldiers are sharing on the new Chinese app, TikTok. Just five weeks remain before Israel's landmark third consecutive elections are held on March 2nd. But all eyes are glued to the White House and the long-awaited Trump administration's peace deal. Ahead of his back-to-back -back meetings in Washington, D.C., United States President Donald Trump is now expected to be giving Israeli leaders just six weeks to get his peace deal of the century off the ground. As for what's in the deal, though, Trump will reportedly reveal key details of the plan to Prime Minister Netanyahu and his rival Benny Gantz during their sit-downs on Monday and Tuesday. Then, after their separate meetings, Trump and Netanyahu are set to deliver joint remarks at the White House, where they're set to publicize more tenets of the peace proposal, too. It's very important visit. I'm looking forward. Uh, the plan of the deal is to deal with Israel security, the regional strategies, and uh, stabilization, hopefully down the road, and I'm looking forward. The major problem, however, is that it takes two to tango, and the Palestinian Authority has been a very unwilling dance partner. In fact, President Trump's administration has reportedly reached out to PA President Abbas multiple times in the past week to invite him to Washington as well. But the PA and several other Arab states, like Jordan, are already rejecting the plan on principle. The PA also believes that the plan will likely be the death of a two-state solution and has therefore started debating the choice to dissolve the PA altogether, along with dropping participation in the Oslo Accords. There is no evidence of American support for a one-state solution, though. Rather, as explained by multiple American sources, including Ambassador to Israel David Friedman, the plan will only incentivize negotiations while taking no definitive positions on the final status of borders and territory. Friedman even says as much in the context of his January 8th speech to the Menachem Begin Heritage Center, explaining that the U.S. supports both the Israelis and Palestinians' indigenous rights to live in dignity, peace, and independence. Well, in other news, it's been nine months since the start of Nama Isakhal's political imprisonment in Moscow, but finally a Russian committee has convened to discuss her official request for pardon. Finally, Nama Isakhal is coming home. The 27-year-old American-Israeli backpacker has officially received a presidential pardon from Moscow, and she's slated to be released soon after. But it's been a very bumpy and uncertain ride till now. In fact, even after President Putin gave his assurances to Nama's mother, Yafa Isakhar, last week, Russian authorities blamed Naama for the delay in her release, saying she failed to officially apply. Then before that, two of her appeals were rejected by Moscow officials. Still, the nightmare is essentially over, just nine months into her captivity. Issachar was originally sentenced to seven and a half years in Russian prison over accusations of smuggling a handful of cannabis in her checked luggage. Charges Nama continues to deny. Moreover, the charges are thought to have been completely political in nature, as Nama was only in Russia for a stopover on her way back to Israel from India. Additionally, the seven and a half year sentence is far harsher than other typical sentences for such a crime, and it all just happened to coincide with the extradition of Russian hacker Alexei Burkov to the United States a move that Russia fiercely tried to prevent. Now, today is International Holocaust Commemoration Day, and people all around the world will be attending remembrance services to honor those who perished during World War II. But while many stand with the Jews who were persecuted and murdered, anti-Semitic outlooks are more prevalent today than they have been since the Holocaust ended. And joining us with more information on this is ILTV's Shanna Fold. Shanna? Okay, so a couple of new studies are out from Germany. Now, one out of five Germans say that the Holocaust is getting too much attention. Um, and another striking figure, 37% who responded to the survey, say that it is time to cease the browbeating. Um, so those are just two shocking figures. It's an offensive figure, honestly, with yeah. the whole browbeating of, comment. Of course it is. I, I mean, I can imagine that there are a lot of young Germans who probably don't want this to be, you know, 
define them. De define them, right, but it's still not okay. You have to remember what has taken place. But what, what is happening in France? Now, just over in France, there's also an uptick in anti-Semitism by 27%. Between 2018 and 2019, threats doubled, and they actually created a task force to go in undercover and investigate these incidents. It's unbelievable. Well, you know, we've been seeing this rise in anti-Semitic incidents across Europe as a whole, um, so I think that Holocaust Remembrance Day this year is more pertinent than ever. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, You're Shannon. welcome. Thank you, Shannon. All right, I hope that you're ready to hear this one, Aaron. Uh, this week I met with an incredible man who survived the Holocaust against all odds and immigrated to Israel. He's almost 90 years old, but he's sharper than both of us combined, let me tell you. Check this out. This is Yeshayahu. He is 87 years old and today he lives in southern Israel. For years, he has refused to talk about what happened to him during the Holocaust as a little Jewish boy living in Galicia, Poland. But today, he wants to tell his story to the world before it's too late. Yeshayahu's mother had just wanted to check in on her little boy to make sure he was safe, because she was being forced into the Jewish ghetto. That was the last time that he saw her, and soon enough, he too was sent to a different ghetto. But he managed to run away with a group of Jews who later became partisans. Yeshayahu was just eight years old, but for more than two years, he found himself hiding out in the forest and being sent on missions behind enemy lines to take down the Nazis. <laughs> But one day he was caught by the Nazis. But Yeshayahu somehow managed to run away. He got his hands on a small machine gun and shot himself out of the villa before escaping into the woods. There, he made his way back to his partisan friends and lived out the rest of the war in the forest. But Yeshayahu's hopes of reuniting with his family were crushed when the war came to an end. Paul, <laughs> 
שאני אהיה את רואה, בואי תבואי, תראי את החצר שלי. הנה, תסתכלי, הבת שלי שירתה בשבת, אני שיברתי בגולני, השתתפתי בכל הקרבות. את יודעת, לא אמרתי שאני מסכן. זה 75 שנים מאז ש... ש... נכון, שנשתחררו בדיוק. מהנאצים. אבל, והיום אתה עדיין חושב על זה? אני לא חושב. אני חושב קדימה. What an incredible man, an amazing story. Yeah, I mean, we, we all cried as he told his story. Yeshayahu is one of 200,000 Holocaust survivors living in Israel today, but by 2035, that number is expected to drop to just 26,000 survivors. And that's why he's made it his mission to share his story with the younger generations. And he actually does that by meeting up with youth every week as part of the Mechul Barim project by ORT Israel and the Foundation for the Benefit of Holocaust Victims. They're funded by the JNF UK, and here to tell us more is Nama Fus, JNF UK's representative here in Israel. So tell us about this program that he participates in. This wonderful program is actually a bridge between generations, uh, between teenagers and Holocaust survivors. Uh, where Holocaust survivors are receiving um, computers and internet connection and uh, teenage volunteers visit them on a weekly basis and teach them computer skills. They teach them how to use Facebook and WhatsApp and Google and how to use a smartphone. Um, but, but I mean, you know, it's not only the Holocaust survivors that are getting something out of this experience, absolutely, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it's the benefit, the impact is actually twofold. Uh, it has a huge um, a huge educational impact. The uh, teenagers get to uh, meet people like Ishayao and hear their stories. Right. And it's so important, especially these days, where the numbers of Holocaust survivors go down, uh, living Holocaust survivors, of course, go down every year. Uh, and of it's course. so important to remember and never forget. Well, Ishayao, for example, he said that for him it's almost rehabilitation to be able to share his story. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, mm -hmm. this kind of, there, there's so many more reasons that it's important that he's sharing the story. But what are the reactions that you get from the kids who have these experiences? It's, uh, these are life-changing experiences. Look, they form uh, deep relationships uh, that carry on beyond the one-year uh, right. volunteering. They keep visiting the, the survivors and they become part of their families and I think uh, it's amazing. Well, I know I want to go back to, to visit Ishio and you probably would want to come with me. I would absolutely want to come with you, yeah. yeah so, I mean, so, so who are some of the kids who are volunteering for this? You know, what the uh, uh, the teenagers are high school uh, te uh, high school students from Ort. There are about four hundred uh, across Israel. Oh, wow. uh, these are uh, children that are committed to this uh, program, Beautiful. and uh, and of course I have to say it also um, th there are social uh, benefits for the survivors as well. I think it helps diminish uh, loneliness for some people, and the the, the bonds are the, the relationships that are formed are very unique. So well, this is one of the amazing programs that JNF UK is helping fund. And I know mm -hmm. that for those who want to volunteer, they can actually check out uh, the JNF UK website and also mm -hmm. Michael Berlin website as well uh, to see what opportunities exist. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we may be on the other side of the world from California, but there are plenty of cries from Israelis following the sudden death of basketball legend Kobe Bryant and his daughter. It's like a knife in my heart. That is what Amari Stoudemire is saying straight from the court last night as he learned the news mid-game. Stoudemire is a former NBA All-Star turned Israeli and the player recently joined Maccabi Tel Aviv and was stopped in the middle of his game to be given the news. He says that his whole family is mourning the loss of this very close friend. I mean, today, when I heard the news on the basketball court today, I was, I was devastated. Uh, Kobe and I have long history of playing with each other with the Olympics, USA team. Uh, I know his family very well, his wife Vanessa and the children. Um, playing against him so many times with the Lakers, with Shaq and Kobe. And, um, he was such a, um, a well-pronounced individual, a very intelligent uh, person and a player. Uh, he was a very dedicated husband to his wife and children. Yeah, this is tragic. Even Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu penned down his thoughts in a social media post saying that a legend like Kobe will not be forgotten. Israelis in Tel Aviv also say that they feel the hit of his loss very hard. I wake up hundreds of times in the night to watch the Lakers play and it's killing me. 
It's killing. I don't. I still hope that I'll, somebody will pinch me and I wake up and it's a bad dream. But wow, it's a basketball legend that just disappeared, just like that. We liked him very much, as I say. Like he was a basketball legend, and as you know, we are in Israel. We like basketball here. We love the Lakers. We love Kobe, the player, the the, the personality. It, um, it's very bad, very sad. I mean, you just really hear people talking about this everywhere. Bryant was killed along with his 13-year-old daughter in a helicopter uh, that crashed into the side of a mountain and then became engulfed in flames. Nine people died in total uh, when they were on the way to a youth basketball game where Bryant's daughter, Gianna, was expected to play with her father coming on board to play coach. Yeah, Bryant played all 20 of his seasons for the LA Lakers, entering the league straight from high school, and he's won five NBA championships, and he represented the United States in the Olympics twice, bringing home two gold medals. But Brian is actually known for a lot more than basketball. He recently won an Academy Award for Best Animated Short Film after an emotional poem that he wrote was illustrated in video form. And the basketball star is estimated to be worth around $680 million. He's donated much of his earnings to charities like After School All Stars, the Make-A-Wish Foundation, and a slew of other NGOs that are meant to help kids. He leaves behind a wife and three daughters. And speaking of tragedy, it seems that doctors are themselves in some need of saving because the Sooka Medical Hospital in the Negev, the third largest hospital in Israel, has just reported its fourth doctor suicide in just 18 months. Israeli psychologist Dr. Kamila Folkash-Levan joins us with more. Thank you so much for being with us. Now, how me. big of a problem is this in Israel? This is a big problem, not just in Israel, but, uh, but also, of course, as we see already in Israel as well. And um, also, it's not like an Israeli problem. And this is sure. a problem of hospitals and also uh, jobs that are very high stress. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, uh, the last suicide was a person that's, um, that's a stagiaire, like in a practicum. Oh. Okay? So he's not, he's not yet very used to seeing the, the difficulties and the deaths and the different injuries. And also, from what I understand, he was also in, uh, in a unit that was high stress unit. Mm -hmm. So think about it like for many hours on end, they do not sleep, which is true for medical uh, professionals in general in certain professions, right. pretty much most. And here is because he's in an internship, that's true even more so. Plus he doesn't have the psychological preparedness to see many of the difficult uh, situations. It's very easy to go that way. And there's also just a complete lack of, of doctors in the state of Israel as a whole. So even the people who are working have just such an enormous amount of work that they have to take on that I, I imagine mm -hmm. that would affect them mentally. Yes. Now, what are the primary causes that you would say for depression and ultimately suicide among doctors? Does it come with a lack of proper emotional training, I guess, before going? Into the I, job? Would, I would say yes. Okay, so in general, the the, the, the general kind of like uh, the, the general layout is as uh, high stress, isolation. Maybe there is drug abuse. That's that's true for general public. Yes. Right. So they're also part of the general public. So we don't know specifics what exactly happened. For example, also if there is uh, suicide in the family, previous uh, history of suicide in the family, mm -hmm. that makes it more okay to go that way. Yes. Yeah. Or maybe a history of uh, depression, anxiety, impulsivity. To, to yes. That. But uh, as far as medical professionals go, I think that it's very important to increase awareness and to have some, some a, a group or a few people or something on staff for every hospital to talk to, to, to your employees, to your doctors, to your uh, nurses, see for, for just employees in general, see, like have a scan, have some kind of a system to not only scan, but also then help and give the support and prepare. And then after you prepare them, to keep talking to them, to keep making sure uh, maintenance, to keep making sure that they're okay. So, so that was actually my next question. You know, mm -hmm. what what programs or, or you know help is available for people who are feeling the stress, who are feeling depression in the medical mm -hmm. field, and is it being taken advantage of, or is there maybe like a like a stigma around it? So I'm very happy that you brought up this uh, thing of stigma because stigma exists in general for us, for all of us, as you know, some cultures more than others. Um, and it's very unfortunate because we're here, we're here, the profession is here, there are social workers, there are psychologists, there are a lot of men, like tons of trained people. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, um, many do not feel comfortable to go and ask. You'll go to a plumber, but you won't go to, <laughs> or a hairdresser, but you won't go to a psychologist, yes? And so uh, there, are, there, are, um, th there are options for medical 
professionals within usually the places, their places of work, but uh, maybe it's not enough or maybe not right. appropriate and could be looked at, but also on, in the general kind of, in the general life, they can go and reach out as well. But yes, the stigma does exist and you're supposed to be strong and you're supposed to handle it by yourself. Well. Well, it's not always that simple, and I know that for my friends who are doctors, I'm constantly asking them, how do you deal with this job on a daily basis? But thank you so much for thank joining you. us and shedding some light on this. Thank you. Now, earlier this month, reports came out that Israel's border police banned their officers from using the Chinese social media app TikTok. But clearly, the IDF hasn't taken this too seriously, and they're making us all want to download this app. ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh, of course, has the story. Hey, guys. So for those who don't know about the platform, it's an app where users film themselves in short videos, dancing, lip syncing, or, you know, creating funny videos. So apparently, uploading videos to, so to this social media app could compromise Israel's security and could potentially harm the reputation of Israeli organizations such as the IDF, border police, and many others. But regardless of all of that, the IDF has created its very own TikTok account with over 5,000 followers and multiple videos showing soldiers in uniform. Take a look at this. So what's life like in the Israeli army? Well, the IDF's new account on the Chinese social media app TikTok definitely gives us an idea. Check out this video showing a shooting practice. <laughs> <laughs> or there are also a few videos on the account that will for sure make you cry. <laughs> the first one you can see two brothers reuniting after a long time apart. Then two sisters reuniting and breaking down in tears. <laughs> <laughs> and then the one that every mother could relate to. <laughs> how about the video where the unit's officer starts beatboxing and at the end tells them their drill is canceled because of the terrible weather. <laughs> You can also see some of the many talents of the IDF soldiers. And how about the raining paratroopers? It's raining me. Basically, anyone that follows the IDF official TikTok account will understand why Israelis are so proud of their army. Well, this unique look into the IDF may all come to an end if the government decides to step in. The United States Army has actually already banned the Chinese app itself, stating that the company behind TikTok could be compelled to provide data and intelligence to the Chinese Communist Party. Honestly, I really hope that yeah. they don't ban the idea from using TikTok because I love watching Indeed, their videos. videos yeah. All right, let us take a look at the weather forecast. We're finally experiencing a warm day after all the crazy storms across Israel. Today we have a high of 19 degrees Celsius in Tel Aviv or 64 Fahrenheit. And tomorrow, skies are expected to be partly cloudy with a high of 18 degrees Celsius or 63 Fahrenheit. There's also a 70% chance of rain tomorrow night, so make sure to carry an umbrella. Now, before we go, let's take a look at what is going viral in Israel on tubing. There's a perfect example of man's best friend starting off early. Yeah, he's that, that baby's just absolutely feeding him snacks from the crib. It's cute. I, it's it's cute. like little brothers. Yeah, I guess. Not how you <laughs> like to train your dogs, but it's that's It's not what... like how I like to train my dog, no. But that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.46 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Aaron Porras. And I'm Natasha Kierchuk. Thanks for watching.